I want to thank all of you for coming here on this morning. This manifestly is a great day for uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, I think as everyone here knows, the Simons Foundation has become a tremendous force in the world of mathematics and the many fields that it touches from theoretical physics to computation. And these worlds more than ever are connected in fundamental ways that affect all of us today and will do so even more so in the future. Today we mark the beginning of a new era at Berkeley, and it's a great pleasure to celebrate the new Simons Institute <coughs> for the Theory of Computing at Berkeley. Uh, this institute undoubtedly will have a significant impact on Berkeley and the world. Uh, first of all, it will serve to help this exciting field expand into new areas, uh, affecting every major realm of science, in, including areas as diverse as mathematics, healthcare, climate modeling, astrophysics, genetics, economics, and business, almost all of which I think are represented here. Uh, it'll help promote discoveries uh, relevant to everyday life, including how to fight diseases, create more accurate climate change models, uh, and make our social and commercial interactions on the internet more secure. Uh, but you can also figure out how to get rid of Public Records Act requests. I personally would <laughs> appreciate that. It will also establish this uh, campus as the worldwide center uh, for theoretical computer science. Uh, the insights gained through the Institute will often reflect back to the theory of computation, that is the fundamental theory, opening new directions, and uh, advancing our understanding of fundamental theoretical issues. And today we're, convened, we're delighted to convene a distinguished panel of leading minds in these fields. Uh, here they are, and you'll hear more shortly. Uh, it's, of course, a special pleasure uh, to have uh, uh, Jim and Marilyn Simons and their three progeny all here uh, present. Uh, Jim is chairman uh, of the board of the Simons Foundation, and Marilyn, I guess you're the president, correct? Right. Uh, uh, both Jim and Marilyn have been longtime friends of Mary Catherine and uh, myself going back to our uh, days at, at MIT. And so it's really a great pleasure to be able to continue this friendship. Uh, and Jim, I think, as you all know, also is board chair and the founder of Renaissance Technologies, uh, which employs very happily one of my former postdocs, so I'm also glad it's a source of employment. Uh, beyond employment, actually. In fact, I'm hoping he's a Berkeley grad. I hope he'll now donate back to Berkeley as well, but that's a... <laughs> uh, prior to his financial career, Jim served as chair of the mathematics department at State University of New York at Stony Brook. He taught mathematics at MIT and Harvard and was a cryptanalyst at the Institute for Defense Analysis in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, everyone here knows he's an alumnus of UC Berkeley, receiving his PhD here in 1962 with his work that later became, well, maybe was famous instantly, but at least in my world, uh, became very famous in churn simons theory because of its uh, possible implications for things actually even people like myself were working on, like superconductivity and lower dimensional physical systems. Uh, we're extremely able to be able to count on Jim's friendship, his relationship to Berkeley as an alumnus, uh, and his visionary philanthropy that we celebrate today. And it's a pleasure to welcome both Jim and Marilyn and their whole family. So thank you. And uh, with that, I think, what's next? Jim. Oh, Jim himself is going to come up and make some remarks. <laughs> Glad you, you remembered who was supposed to come up next. <laughs> <laughs> I was waving frantically there. <laughs> anyway, Marilyn and I are delighted to be here. It's, it's funny, I, I've always loved mathematics and uh, always hated programming. I, uh, I, I tried twice to learn how to program. Both attempts were massive failures. And, uh, and that was very early on, and I vowed never to try again. And I haven't. I kept that. It was an easy vow to keep. <laughs> but I did go to this place, the Institute for Defense Analysis, for a couple of years, in fact four, to be a code cracker, not knowing quite what I was getting into. They hired mathematicians and 
so they teach us that stuff. And it turned out uh, I, I really liked it a lot. Um, there was a lot of data. There were a lot of computers. Fortunately, I did not have to program these computers in any sense. There were people who did that for us. But I learned about trying to make fast algorithms, trying to do statistical analyses of, of data. And I found, that, uh, I found that a lot of fun. And I also discovered this question of complexity, which is a big issue in computer science. What's, how do you just tell whether a function is easily computed, hard to compute, how do you measure this? And I started thinking about those questions because code cracking or, uh, or code making is very much um, uh, connected with this, with this question. Uh, a good code is a, is a map which in one direction is easy to calculate and in the other direction is hard. At least you hope it's hard because that's where the security lies. And I started thinking uh, in the mid-60s when I was there about this question. Well, how do you tell if a map that's easy has a inverse that's hard. And a famous mathematician named Andy Gleason pointed out that almost all of these are going to have very hard inverses, very hard to calculate inverses, just by counting, a counting argument, which I won't give you here today. Uh, and it made me start thinking, well, how did you, how would you axiomatize this or think about it? Or what do you think? Of and then you know, I still was sort of blundering around, and someone pointed me at a paper by a fellow named Manuel Blum, which was a beautiful early paper in this field of complexity. And I realized, hey, some very smart guys are thinking about this problem. And since I was a geometer at heart, I decided, okay, good, it's, not, it's in good hands, this problem. We'll let these fellows, <laughs> <laughs> we'll let these fellows think about it and see what they come up with. And they've been thinking about it ever since. Uh, but but it's, it's really a beautiful problem, questions of, questions of complexity and what kind of algorithms can you make and can't you make. And, and I, I haven't worked in the field at all, uh, but I've always sort of been hooked on the notion of its beauty and its depth. It's really a, gives rise to a wonderful set of questions. At a certain point, I left math and went into business. Uh, which is why we're all here today in a sense, because otherwise <laughs> it was a convenient step. Uh, <coughs> and there uh, uh, I took, to some extent, what we, I learned at IDA in, in, in the code cracking business, and we had a lot of data and big computers and plenty of programmers, and, uh, and, we, did, and we did very well. And, at a certain point, Marilyn and I started a foundation and have gradually transitioned to philanthropy in our foundation. And at a certain point in the growth of the foundation, we decided to get better organized and uh, begin to target our giving uh, rather than just giving to institutions that we knew and loved. And uh, one of the steps was to bring on David Eisenbud, who I think is here somewhere, standing over there, with, uh, to head the, the math and physical science portion of our giving. And the first thing David did was convene a series of roundtables in each of the three fields that Bob mentioned, mathematics, uh, theoretical physics, and computer science, to see what the fields felt, or the people representing the fields felt, would be the most important things that our foundation could do for their respective fields. And interestingly, the computer science group, in their prioritization, put an institute such as this at the top of their list. The mathematicians didn't. There are other mathematics institutes around, and the theoretical physicists, the same. But the computer scientists really didn't have anything like this. And this is what they wanted the most. And frankly, I, I was very pleased. I really liked, I liked the idea. And uh, I was glad that they came to their, that conclusion. And the process by which we find ourselves here today was an interesting one. I thought very well executed by David. Uh, 
there was a request for uh, letters of intent from uh, institutions who would like to be a candidate for this institution and for this uh, operation. And we got 18, I believe, letters of intent. And we threw away, I say we, there was a panel of which I was not a member. Uh, they threw away 12 and invited six universities to apply, make a full application. And suggested at the time, your application hopefully will be more forthcoming than did your letter of intent in terms of what the university would contribute. And those six applications were studied carefully, three were discarded, and three were in, told we would make a, I say we, I didn't go on them, there would be a site visit. And on passant, if you want to improve your application still further, con mucho gusto. As, uh, <laughs> and everybody did, the three, the final three. Uh, did and site visits were made and everyone was as forthcoming as they could be and then the, the team all disinterested parties except possibly for David who has a tenuous relationship to Berkeley namely he's a, you know, just a full professor here that's, a, that's his only connection uh, but David tried to re recuse himself whatever it is the word from these discussions and it was really a very uh, close decision between the three finalists. But um, the decision was made based uh, on four uh, issues. Vision, leadership, environment, and facility. And Berkeley's leadership, uh, proposed leadership under Dick Karp was stupendous. Uh, the vision that Berkeley created, the, the outreach vision uh, that uh, Bob mentioned uh, a bit, was a very fine one. The environment was excellent too because there was very good computer science here at Berkeley. Uh, not the biggest uh, concentration in the world, but very fine people. And the facility, this building that uh, maybe uh, you'll see a picture of or something like that, uh, that was uh, gonna be its home was ideal. Other places had good things too, but Berkeley won by a nose, maybe two noses, I said here, but, uh, <laughs> and it had nothing whatever to do with my having gotten my degree here years ago. So Marilyn and I were delighted, are delighted with the outcome, and we want to congratulate the institution and the world of computer science for getting this place. So, thanks very much. Thanks so much, Jim. It's great to have you and your, your family here and to celebrate this uh, really wonderful event. And of course, the, the wise choice that you and your board made <laughs> in uh, honoring your alma mater here. Um, we, we just couldn't be more pleased. Um, the, the whole process of generating this proposal for the Simons Foundation. I, by the way, nobody introduced me, I just realized. Uh, in case you're wondering who I am, I'm Mark Richards. I'm the Dean for Mathematical and Physical Sciences here at Berkeley, so um, sorry about that. Um, the process by which we generated the proposal was really a remarkable coming together across the campus. And ironically, the, the final coup de grace, the coming together that that kind of most excited us was at the very end of the site visit. Uh, we entertained the, the visiting panel, and, which included David Eisenbutt and others, and we had a round table uh, in mass. We, we, we seated the, the panel in a rather large room and surrounded them with what it must have been at least 50 or 60 Berkeley professors from fields as diverse as economics and biology and, and mechanical engineering and, and, and so forth. And each person around the room went and told why they were so excited about doing something like this. Um, and I think we excited the panel, but we also excited ourselves in the process. So today we're going to reproduce that for you in miniature with these distinguished panels, panelists lined up kind of like American Idol here <laughs> for, for you. Uh, and it's my pleasure uh, to, to introduce them. 
And then uh, Professor Sastry, Dean Sastry, is going to eliminate three of the contestants to death. <laughs> uh, and and he, will, he will interview us, and hopefully we'll spark this conversation. And if we get through the introductions quickly enough, there will be plenty of time for questions from the, uh, the, the audience. So let me just get on with the introductions. Uh, Joshua Bloom is an associate professor of astronomy. Robert Bryant is the director of Mathematical Sciences Research Institute and a professor of mathematics. David Culler is the department chair and the Howard Friesen Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. David Eisenbud is the director uh, of Mathematics and Physical Sciences for the Simons Foundation and also a professor of mathematics at Berkeley and in about a year will become the director of the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute as well. Dick Karp is the uh, Simons Institute faculty director and is also a professor of electrical engineering, computer science, bioengineering, uh, industrial engineering and operations research, and mathematics. I don't know how he <laughs> has time for all of that, uh, but now he has a new hat to wear. Uh, Deborah Nolan is professor of statistics and the co-director of the Berkeley Science and Math Initiative and the associate dean for mathematical and, sci uh, and physical sciences. Leo Pachter is a professor of mathematics, EECS, molecular and cell biology, and the director for the Center for Computational Biology. Prabhaka Raghavan is a Berkeley alum and is also the co-chair of the Simons Institute Scientific Advisory Board and is the vice president for engineering at Google. Horst Simon is a deputy director of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and an adjunct professor of electrical engineering and computer science. Kimmen Scholander is an associate professor of bioengineering and plant and microbial bio biology. And I guess I'm to be seated here as well, and I'm a professor of earth and planetary science. Uh, our moderator and question provocateur, provocateur today is uh, Shankar Sastri, who's a professor of electrical engineering and computer science, and also the dean of the College of Engineering. Shankar, it's your show. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, it, it's a great day to be doing this, and as Mark said, to do a miniature version of what we had at, on the day of the site visit. Our goal for today's panel is to provide a window into the new Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing. So the format I, we had in mind is to begin with a panel discussion with some questions from me, and then we'll open up the discussion to our audience, and uh, I hope that you'll also bring your own interests and questions into this conversation. Uh, so what I'll try to do is start off and get everybody a little warmed up, and then we'll invite the audience to join in, and I think we'll have floating microphones that will be, uh, which uh, we're recording all of this, so please use the microphones. L let me start with uh, Dick Karp. Uh, Dick, what's your vision for the Institute? <laughs> Oh, interesting question. <laughs> well, we would like to create an environment where uh, the outstanding theoretical computer scientists and scientists in related fields from around the world uh, can be brought together and enabled to do their best work, to provide a setting where they can function collaboratively to advance different fields uh, within theoretical computer science and its applications. In selecting the particular programs and, e and emphasis within the institute, we would, of course, like to represent all of the fundamental unsolved questions in complexity, cryptography, and related areas of mathematical logic that have been driving the field for half a century. But we also have a certain worldview uh, concerning the outreach of concepts from the theory of computing to other fields. We feel that, uh, although it hasn't always been fully recognized, um, many of the phenomena in the physical, biological, engineering, and social sciences, and even in the world of commerce, uh, can be viewed in terms of information processing. It's more traditional in the physical sciences to view them in terms of transformations, uh, uh, physical transformations and energy balances and the like. But we think that there's a complementary point of view 
in which these phenomena can be described through computational models. And these models will be very interesting in themselves and we think will reflect back to produce interesting questions for the inner world of theoretical computer science as a whole. So our vision is to facilitate this work while striking a balance between the core problems that are already recognized in the field and the outreach of the field to biology, genetics, uh, statistical physics, uh, economics, analysis of the World Wide Web, social networks, and a host of other areas. Uh, Robert, let me come to you. Uh, how, how does traditional mathematics interact with the modern theory of computing? Of course, beyond uh, exterior differential systems, geometry, <laughs> cryptanalysis. Yeah. Uh, well, actual you know, computation in its, in, uh, in its well-known forms has been you know, intimately entwined with mathematics for a long time. I mean, you're starting already with, uh, with Gödel, Turing, and von Neumann all together and their, their interactions. But in the last few years, what we've noticed, the last 20 years or so, uh, computation, particularly computation of complicated examples or assembling large data sets in various problems, has become a key part of making progress in, in, uh, in areas like algebraic geometry, topology, differential geometry. And, uh, and the, so computation has, has really become a lot more important. One thing that's, uh, that puzzles us, and one thing that I, I hope that uh, some, some future program that the, uh, that the Institute will, be, will uh, uh, involve is uh, something David and I were just talking about a little earlier, is it's a little bit puzzling why our computations are so effective. I mean, you know, the worst case analysis, which is what a lot of complexity theory does, would predict that many of the things that we'd like to compute and be able to understand are really beyond our, beyond uh, the reach of any of our algorithms. But in fact, uh, that's turned out not to be the case in many cases. And it points, that, points out that probably there's something deep to be still understood about the nature of computation and computational structures. Uh, and I'd like to see that pursued. Uh, great. Hold that thought because I'm going <laughs> to get back to that. But before we do that, uh, David, how will the Institute change computer science? So I'd say we have, uh, we have high hopes for the, for the Institute, maybe a, a tall bar. Um, in you know, computing, we may have uh, connected 2 billion of the world's people this year and whatnot, but it's amazing how much we don't know. Uh, you know, basic questions like, Surely it's easier to check the answer than to solve the problem in the first place, but uh, for 40 years we still haven't really solved that. So if it makes headway on a few little things like solving the P versus MP question, we'll be fine with that. <laughs> uh, and, and of course, you know, when, when theory hits, it hits big. And if you think about uh, automated language translation or cryptography, a theoretical idea that just completely transformed how we think about problems. But I'd say um, maybe on the last one, I had the benefit of getting to hang out as a child with the pioneers of the field. And, and my father used to say, what was really exciting about computing was not just as a tool for cranking out and computing the answer when you knew how to solve the problem, but to help you solve the problem. And I think really the, the institute is taking that one step further about helping you to think about solving the problem and how this computational thinking really changes how we view the, the sciences. And I think that will cut in so many different ways. Uh, David, uh, David Eisenbahn, uh, you know, uh, we just heard from, Simon, uh, from Jim about uh, how the competition for the award was pretty stiff, but I'm sure our Berkeley audience would like to hear a bit more about <laughs> <laughs> your, your completely unbiased perspective on uh, how, the, how the competition unfolded. Of course, we can't say often enough how wonderful you all are. <laughs> uh, Jim said it very well, but uh, let, me, let me dice it in a slightly different way. Really, I have the same points that he made. Um, I want to single out four factors, and they're really the same factors, though they'll have different names. Um, two internal and two external, perhaps. The first factor is really very well represented by this room. There are an enormous scientific potential right here, and they, you represent the Berkeley potential very well, I think. Uh, it's really a fantastic group of scientists and engineers who will come to interact directly with the Institute here. 
and that was one of our key items when we reviewed different places. Do they have the intellectual potential as a whole, not just in computer science, to support this kind of ambitious venture? The second internal factor I would say was, I would call facilities and resources. Jim described very well the process by which the package came to be. But um, let me say that two things were, were very important. In terms of resources, of course, leadership of the Institute was a key one. And I can assure you the panel talked about all the potential leaders and admired certainly very much the three who were in the final competition. But everybody said, Dick Carp is the best. And uh, so <laughs> this was a major factor. <laughs> So that's one kind of, of resource that, that uh, Berkeley brings to bear. Another big one for us, and one that was mentioned in all our original uh, calls for proposals, was the building. And when we toured the building, Kelvin Hall, that's going to be available to us, and saw the architect's renderings of what imagined spaces would look like, uh, we were really very impressed. And I think that would be an ideal home. It's in the center of the scientific quad and has lots of space. It has some nice areas outside, at least once the trees are planted. <laughs> and, uh, the chancellor has promised to plant at least one himself. <laughs> and, uh, so I think that's going to be an extremely attractive place there. Um, the external things, I would put vision in that category in the sense that uh, the institute here looks out to the sciences in an extremely attractive way. Again, that was part of the original design that we had in mind. Uh, the lens on the sciences, one of Dick's great phrases, um, is, is a very powerful idea and was powerful for us in the decision. There's an outward focus from computer science. Of course, we're very interested also in the inner focus, in the P versus NP. I hope you solve it very soon. <laughs> Get that out of the way. Computer science is unfulfilled thesis problem. <laughs> Unsolved thesis problem. And another sense in which the outward focus was extremely important to us was in that Berkeley really seemed to have in mind the idea of engaging the whole world, the whole world of computer science and the scientists more generally outside the Berkeley campus. This is from the beginning we, we said often that... Uh, we were not trying to forward the goals of some institution. We were trying to forward the goals of the field. And Berkeley, I believe, has the idea and the vision and the capability of bringing people from far and wide to the institute here, being good hosts to them. That's an organizational matter, too, as I know very well from MSRI experience, and uh, making this the destination in computer science bringing the world to the door. Now, it happens to be the door of Berkeley, and that's a nice place to be, especially from the point of view of Berkeley professors like me. But that, as I say, wasn't the point. And we were really very pleased with this kind of outward focus that the Institute had. So I think those are the primary uh, factors, sliced simply in a different way, a little bit, than what Jim said, the same idea uh, that we had in mind. Uh, David, of course, MSRI had a, and what you've done at MSRI had a huge impact in terms of helping us put together our proposals. So I, I'd like to thank you and Robert and for uh, sort of showing us the way. I have to say, you know, I watched the uh, solar eclipse from the Overlook, the Roger Strauch uh, Auditorium Overlook yesterday, and I was imagining this landscaping uh, that you talked about could really have some of the features of that o overlook space that you have in MSRI. So we'll, we'll try to, we'll try to do, uh, do, do that well. So thank you very much. Uh, moving on, uh, let me talk to, uh, let me ask Deb. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the Berkeley Science and Math Initiative and what you think are the connections being forged between the Simons Institute and the uh, Berkeley Science and Math Initiative? Sure, happy to. Um, <clears throat> the Berkeley Science and Math uh, Initiative is a university-wide initiative to try and help improve science and math education at the K-12 level. It was designed and developed by um, science, engineering, and math faculty, and it involves two programs. Um, one is CalTeach, 
which is an undergraduate program for science and math majors who want to become science and math teachers at the K-12 level. And the other is a professional development program for master teachers called uh, Math for America Berkeley. Um, many of you might not know that um, Math for America Berkeley is part of a nationwide Math for America, and it was uh, founded by Jim Simons. And so it's very exciting for us to see how there's a real potential for synergy between these, these two programs. Um, some ideas might be um, <clears throat> research experiences for master teachers to bring uh, computer science uh, topics into the classroom, curriculum development, and other outreach activities. I just want to give you one, one little example, <clears throat> excuse me, one little example of what might happen. Um, every semester, about 200 Cal undergraduates go out to classrooms every week for an hour and in the Bay Area. And they, um, in the course of a semester, they teach a couple of lessons, really exciting, fun math science lessons. Thank you. <laughs> and just imagine if these kids, um, our Cal students, could be teaching some topic in discrete mathematics in um, computational math that gets the students really excited about <clears throat> continuing on in math and science and learning about the connections to the theory of computing so that they might continue through high school in math and science and go on to college and major in math and science. So we're, we're thrilled to be able to, um, to participate and partner with the Simons Institute in, in this arena. And uh, Deb's partner in crime, George Johnson, is yes, also here. Yes, he's out in the he audience. Is, uh, is, uh, right. So uh, thank you, both, mm -hmm. both of you. Uh, Lior, uh, computational biology has been uh, one of the most promising domains for this lensing into of the, uh, the theory of computing into the biological sciences. Can you help us understand the ways in which this institute will advance the state of research in this area? Uh, yes, thanks, Shankar. Um, well, perhaps you know, I'll, I'll answer this by um, Quoting the title of a famous essay by uh, the geneticist Theodor Dobzhansky, who said that um, nothing in biology makes sense uh, except in the light of evolution. And I think every biologist knows this is true, whether it's from the most applied aspects of biology uh, or even to the theoretical ones, every discovery comes about on, uh, at the end of the day because you think about evolution. Um, and I think that every computer scientist knows that nothing in evolution makes sense except in the light of computation. And uh, I, I think that, you know, here I, I'm, I'm speaking of computation in the, com in the complexity uh, sense. Um, ultimately, our understanding of evolution uh, has to be based on, on sort of profound um, uh, discoveries that have yet to be made. Um, in evolution, we need to understand what kind of complexity can be generated in biology from biological molecules and systems. Um, and, you know, there, there are just so many mysteries in biology. I'd like to give just one quick example, which is that um, of all the storage media, DNA is the, is, is the, is, has the highest fidelity. We have DNA sequences that have been perfectly conserved for hundreds of million years, whereas even our most advanced noiseless technologies for storage you know, last maybe a decade or two. So we're very, very far from understanding exactly how this works and why. Um, and I think ultimately um, this institute is really, really important because um, the excitement in biology has really been focused on data generation, and, and of course uh, uh, that's very exciting, but somehow the emphasis on, on theory and, and the impacts it can have on biology uh, need a, a, a home and, and an intellectual home for, for thinking about and, and for progress, and the Institute will serve that purpose. I'd just like to say one more thing about big data, because we have a lot of that in biology, and I was just recently talking to my colleague Stephen Brenner, and we did a back of the envelope calculation about where does the big data really lie? And we came to the conclusion that the largest data sets are actually in this room. Um, each of you has uh, you know, something like on the order of 10 to the 13th cells, um, and then another 10 times that bacterial cells that, uh, that are really your host. Um, on top of that, you have you know, probably roughly the same order of magnitude molecules. So describing a biological system ultimately involves something on the order of an Avogadro's number, uh, number of bits. And we've really only started to collect exactly that information. I think the challenges are just extraordinary, and ultimately that's what's needed to understand evolution. So I'm very excited about uh, the role this institute will play. Wonderful. Uh, Prabhakar, you're the guy from industry here. Uh, so uh, 
Uh, tell us. <laughs> Sorry, that could have been a better introduction, I presume. <laughs> But, uh, you know, Google and Microsoft India, Microsoft Research in India are uh, two of the industrial, uh, initial industry, uh, industrial corporate partners for the institute. Why, why, sh why does industry care about the Simons Institute? Let me begin with a simple specific instance and then use it to make a general point. Uh, I worked in the internet industry for a number of years now. and. Uh, this has been one of, obviously, the fastest growing segments of technology over the last decade or so. About 15 years ago, I was exposed to what I found to be a dazzling insight that came from one of the members of the Simons Institute being constituted, uh, namely that the right way to look at the internet was not as a technology artifact, but really you need to look at it as a game theoretic art artifact. So, the internet is several billion people playing a large game. Right? And if you think of it in those terms, it gives rise to the entire economics underlying the internet. And, and so that started to build a fruitful connection between microeconomics and computer science. And that was really, uh, Berkeley was the home to that originally, and it's had literally hundreds of billions of dollars of impact on the industry. Now, if I step back, uh, I want to make the point that this kind of transdisciplinary connection isn't something that we in industry with our quarterly reporting uh, burdens have the time to think about. Uh, and when I think about the Simons Institute, I think of it as an ideal home to, to create and engender these kinds of insights that, that will last us decades to come. Thank you. Uh, you know, I'll pick up on this mechanism design of Prabhakar's to ask Mark, how, how you think uh, the work of the institute is going to influence all the fields that it touches, neuroscience, economics, astronomy, uh, computational biology, and uh, how, how do you think it'll, if, uh, it'll change our intellectual landscape here? My answer to that is that I don't know. And I think that uh, it's, the, it's the lack of connection between computer science and many of these application fields that has evolved that makes this institute so exciting. I, I'm a geophysicist and a planetary physicist, and I work on how the whole planetary system works. Uh, take the Earth, for example. We have uh, turbulence in the core. We have extreme changes in material behavior and mineral uh, phase transformations in, in our mantle and our plates. We have faults. We have an atmospheric chemistry that we don't understand very well. We have clouds. All of these different physical systems interact, and the mode of programming, to go back to Jim's comments on programming, the mode of, mode of programming that has been undertaken for the most part in trying to understand large complex <coughs> physical systems has largely been slapping together codes that treat separate parts of the system. We have not become very sophisticated in our ways, and we haven't really interacted, in my opinion, very effectively with what fundamental computer science might be able to offer in understanding how complex physical systems work, whether it's turbulence or whether it's, it's cell membranes or, or whether it's, it's uh, supernova explosions. And the opportunity to bridge, to, to, to have a real conversation and to learn from the, not only learn from the computer scientists, but the hope that some of these very interesting physical problems might bounce back and actually engender fundamental breakthroughs in computer science. That's, that's what excites me the most about this institute. That's the window that we're opening. I wish I knew where we were going to go, but in some ways it's, it's more exciting for, for, for you not to know. Uh, but this, uh, having been around the computational physics business and fluid mechanics business for a while and seen the evolution of the field, I have never seen an opportunity like this to do a deep dive with people in computer science and people who solve the partial differential equations that govern most of the universe and, and make some real quantum advances and, and, and have it go both ways. So this, this is just tremendously exciting. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Kimmin, I understand big data is going to be well, the topic of one of the two inaugural programs of the Institute in fall, starting in fall 2013. Can you help us understand about the kind of breakthroughs in big data that might impact what you're working on? 
biology has so many questions that involve big data. It's, it's hard to know where to start because the number of big data problems is huge. So let me just take a, a step back and then I'll come back to the question of big data. I come from a field of computer science known as machine learning, where the question is, how does one extrapolate from observations to information? So how do we take in data and produce information? So lots of data is not the same thing as a lot of information. In biology, there are thousands of different data types, and each of these data points is typically very noisy. So if you think, I work in genomics. I worked on the annotation of the human genome. Understanding one genome alone is very challenging because every single gene needs to be put into an evolutionary context. What are the relatives in other species of that gene, and what can you extrapolate from what is known about those genes, from human to mouse, to rat, to zebrafish, to Drosophila, to yeast, and all the way to bacteria, we have relationships that you can detect. This is going on what Lear was noting. You can detect these relationships computationally. But what can you do with them? So there's different aspects of what we think of as a gene's function that can be inferred from different types of data, but the computational infrastructure to organize all that data is really missing. So I think this is the biggest challenge that is confronting modern biology is most biologists are not really comfortable with computers and with quantitative approaches. So the computational methods need to be put into a framework that is intuitive for the biologists to be able to query so they can get the answers that they need. And I'll give you an illustration of how that could work. Some of you remember watching Star Trek and three-dimensional chess. So each of those chess boards you can think of as an interactome, all the interactions in a genome, the pathways that a genome may accomplish, the physical associations and the functional associations. That's one chessboard. But all of these genomes are related to each other. We are very closely related to chimp. In fact, if you look at the human-chimp relationship, it is closer than two species of whales. And you can line up in a, what's called a multiple sequence alignment of genes or proteins or RNA sequences you can actually infer the evolutionary history of those genes. And then from that, you can actually get at which sequences might have, or genes, might have the same exact function. So these are the vertical linkages between the chessboard. So you can say this pawn is the equivalent of that pawn. So from human to mouse, you know which pawns are orthologs in these different species. This gives you a wiring diagram across the tree of life. So imagine 18 million right now, 18 million nodes are representing each gene, and now you have all these different types of connections between those nodes. And there's many different types of connections between those nodes, and there's very noisy, sparse data sprinkled across this network. Now you can bring in the algorithms that can be applied to this infrastructure, and they can be used to propagate information across the network. And using a Google analogy, in Google Earth right now, you can see the, the geospatial re um, relationships between places. But imagine that instead of looking at it that way, you said, let's look at the relationships between countries based on their historical associations. So New York City would be right next to Amsterdam. So this is the type of different uh, spatial representation of the biological data that we need, because different aspects of gene function have different relationships to each other and can be inferred with different types of edges in that network. So I don't know if I've actually answered your question, but, but I think that there are ways for computer scientists to come into the big data problem and provide infrastructures for actually extracting information, giving answers to biologists that allow them to actually get at the insights that they would need for actually computationally probing them. During the site visit, by the way, you know, Mike Jordan talked a little bit about how more data didn't always mean better information unless you had algorithms which actually were, got better. And that, I think, is certainly one of the uh, topics that uh, was proposed in the original proposal. So there's, uh, I'm sure, a, a lot of uh, give and take there. Uh, let, let me, uh, uh, you know, the general plan is to give everybody just two minutes of airtime and then to make this more of a conversation. Uh, let me uh, give Horst and uh, Josh the, uh, Horst, can you talk a little bit about computation? and the role of LBL and the connections between uh, you know, the world's fastest supercomputer, the number fourth largest supercomputer, I should say, nowadays, but, uh, and, uh, and the theory of computing. 
So computation has been an increasingly important element of uh, the work that we're doing at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. Uh, as you probably all know, the lab has a long history in the physical science, in physics, chemistry, material science, and more recently has focused on very challenging problems in energy environment. And observing what's happening at the lab over the last 10 or 15 years, I can by now say that very much, pretty much every single discipline has ventured into computation as a tool. And with that being said, almost the things that I wanted to say have been said. Mark Richards said very well how computation plays a role in the physical sciences and how the Simons Institute in the future by, uh, in, in a sense, making us think more about the limits of computation, about complexity, about the algorithms, uh, may lead to a new horizon of our understanding what is physically computable for physical sciences. Similarly, Kim and Will and, and Leo talked about the biological applications where we are at the beginning of uh, understanding um, how biology has become a computational discipline and again, the Institute can make pro significant progress in working in these two areas. Uh, certainly there's also the challenge of large data and I'm pleased to say that the NERSC Center at LBNL will provide both compute and data services to the Simons Institute. But since everything has been covered, I said I'll venture out and say something which personally, in a sense, has sort of moved me. And I've been running very large supercomputer centers and there are two things that really have pushed us towards limits. One is parallelism and the other one is power. So in terms of parallelism, we're today at a, a threshold of a couple of hundred thousand cores going to a million or 10 million cores. And while my colleagues in computational complexity have thought about parallelism uh, very deeply for many years, the actual models of parallelism that we have on current parallels, on current large scale systems are different from what theoretically has been for, uh, formulated and investigated. So I believe there's a huge opportunity to explore 30 to 40 years of research in computational complexity and see how it really applies to massively parallel systems that you will see in the future. The second one is, is a very close to me because it comes down to money and the environment. The big supercomputers that we have, we're just building this big building up on the hill that some of you may have noticed, which is a big annoyance because it slows down traffic. But that building will require at the end 18 to 20 megawatts of compute power to run the supercomputers of the future. And whenever I walk through there, I say there's something fundamentally wrong because uh, if you do a little bit back of the envelope calculation, the human brain runs on 30 watts. And if you look at the energy efficiency of current supercomputers, there is a million, fact of million really difference between the human brain and what computers take. So, what does that have to do with the Simons Institute? Let me make hark back to this. We have the real problem that we don't think of computation as a physical phenomenon. When people think about computational complexity, they think mostly about time complexity, maybe about space complexity. But I think we also have a way to think about in the future about computation, power consumption, energy complexity. And I think that's another wonderful challenge that I think the Simons Institute, maybe in five years, will have a whole new theory how to think about this topic. Wonderful, thank you. I guess this gives new meaning to the smoke coming out of your ears. Uh, <laughs> Josh, take it away. Tell us about astronomy and big data and discovering black holes, galaxies, all of that. So astronomy has always been a, a data-driven discipline. Um, and if you think about uh, the ancients, they, of course, didn't hypothesize the existence of eclipses, but they tried to understand it. And likewise, uh, Brahe uh, more or less didn't uh, expect a supernova uh, that's now named after him. It would just appear in the heavens, and he had to make sense of that, and the other people uh, who thought about the implications for our worldview um, uh, obviously understood just uh, how incredibly critical it was for changing that. So one of the things um, that uh, astronomers love is, and has always been part of our DNA in some sense, is that sort of uh, commuting with data, the taking of it, um, the, the, the looking at it, the discovery on it, and then the inference about it. And what's changing because of the, the sheer uh, volume and velocity of the data is that traditional role of astronomer in the sort of real-time scientific loop is, is changing, and we, we have to abstract ourselves from that. Um, in places where we had ourselves or our army of graduate students or undergraduates looking at data, in making decisions about what to do next, what's, what's happening is we uh, are starting to recognize that, that machines, and in particular machine learning algorithms, 
um, are taking uh, the place of that. And once you start imbuing um, your scientific workflow with these new tools, obviously great things can happen, but um, it obviously upsets a number of astronomers that they're not going to have that same sort of intimate relationship. Um, but what we've recognized is that some of the data sets that we have, the heterogeneity of it, uh, the, uh, the fact that we're looking at um, time series data and uh, some of it's noisy and spurious, uh, is actually um, very taxing for some of the basic algorithms that exist out there, at least the ones that are accessible to us. And so there is already this sort of give and take where the outreach that the Science Institute is going to do for people like us in data-driven disciplines uh, is that we'll be able to draw from uh, new knowledge creating, uh, created at the theoretical level. We also feel like um, we'll be able to pass back these interesting data sets. So um, one of the things I think that's most important for me is not just using machine learning as, as a tool because uh, it's out there and it's sort of the new whiz-bang thing, um, but because it's absolutely essential to us actually doing big uh, impact work in the future. We often are thinking about finding anomalies in the data. Um, we're trying to do needle in the haystack work, and that's always been the case, and now it's just happening on a massive scale. Uh, just do a couple of quick follow-up questions that I'd like to get the audience involved in just a minute. Uh, Dick, uh, just a little bit of a follow-up. Is there a particular sort of scientific worldview that will guide you in selecting the programs? And can you give us some insights as to how you'll choose the programs of the Institute going forward? Well, of course, we're going to try to choose programs that will draw a, a significant interdisciplinary audience, bringing together people from around the world and uh, whose disciplines uh, neighbor one another um, but are different enough that people can, can learn. A good example of the kind of program that we would like to mount in the future uh, is one that took place at the Math Sciences Research Institute back in... 2005, and this was in the field of statistical physics. Uh, statistical physics, uh, which deals largely with uh, stochastic models of interactions among uh, atoms or electrons or other uh, small-scale elements uh, in, uh, in physical systems, magnets and the like. Um, involves uh, probabilistic modeling and the notion of a phase transition. The simplest well-known example would be the uh, freezing of water into ice. And this has been studied from uh, the viewpoints of many different disciplines. It's been studied by mathematicians, computer scientists, statisticians, physicists, and others. And uh, these have been done more or less in isolation. And what was achieved at this 2005 meeting was the, uh, the sort of marriage of these fields and the growth of the ability of people in these different fields to understand each other. So on the mathematical and computer science side, the, um, uh, there were certain rigorous mathematics that was done that could answer some of the questions that arose in the physical systems. On the physics side, um, they had tremendous intuitions which led them to, so to speak, know the answers, but not in the sense of the mathematical proofs that we would require as mathematical scientists. And the languages were very different. And by bringing them together, it turned out that these fields really could productively work together and understand each other. And I think it's led to um, a real uh, renaissance in, in the development, merging the rigor of the mathematical sciences with the insights of, of the physical scientists. So it's that kind of merger that we would like to gather. We would like to uh, include a number of different fields. Uh, we'll run two programs every semester once we're in full swing. Um, and there, there are many, many candidates for those programs. Uh, ranging over, uh, ranging from uh, theory of evolution to understanding the economics of the internet to big data, but um, always looking for the, 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 the threads across and also trying to strike a balance. So at some point in the future, we'll probably have a full year on um, core problems in traditional computer science, the P versus NP questions and related ones that are um, still not well understood. So we will be sort of balancing the investigation of these core problems while gently prodding the field 
towards working at the interfaces with the sciences, not only physical and biological, but also the economic sciences, which are so important in the current information technology uh, framework. Robert, uh, you know, in our conversations before, we talked about you know, turning the tables, and you know, you had auto minimal systems about logic and uh, computing at MSRI. And so, can you elaborate a little bit on how you think the Simons Institute would uh, have served that function? Uh, sure. W uh, as you said, we've had uh, we've had several programs that have uh, that have used computation, needed computation, needed consultation with uh, with computational uh, experts in various different uh, various different uh, levels along the road, and uh, and as you know, MSRI is is also modeled on this uh, on this uh, having programs, semester long or year long programs, where we get uh, a group of experts in a particular area assemble a virtual community to actually make it a real community, a uh, physical community for uh, for a semester or a year in a particular area, and as we look down the road at at different uh, different uh, subdisciplines in mathematics that might use computation or might be interested or might be able to take advantage of having a group of experts nearby, one of the things we'll be looking for is possible synergies in programs, both workshops, programs, uh, summer schools, where we can where we can collaborate with the Simons Institute to uh, to uh, share expertise, share problems, share ideas and questions. Uh, I think there's a there's a tremendous opportunity for a kind of synergy there, an interface between uh, the sort of the the more traditional mathematics communities and the computer science communities that uh, that we're now in a position to take a really great advantage of, and I'm looking forward to that. Super, and you know, uh, Dick alluded to uh, these probabilistic measures of uh, phase transition on going from hard to not so hard. So I think he really threw down the gauntlet to. A mathematical understanding of this transition, for which you alluded to in your earlier, uh, you know, in your earlier remarks. So, uh, oh yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, just this, uh, the program we just ended, uh, random spatial processes, mm -hmm. had uh, exactly these kinds of problems that people were trying to understand. You know, how does uh, how does apparently random phenomena assemble rather delicate and, uh, and beautiful repeatable structures. How do you understand what those structures are mm -hmm. in the, when there's a lot of noise around? Mm -hmm. uh, they're there, but, uh, but it takes a kind of uh, a, a deep understanding to really understand you know, SLE, which, is, uh, which has become uh, a major industry now in, in, uh, in mathematics and random special processes and in, uh, and in conformal field theory. Uh, the uh, you know just being able to to run simulations and and look at what the possibilities are and how they develop is a uh, is a real challenge for us, but it's really important. So. Uh, Prabhakar, you're the co-chair with Maria Clave of the Scientific Advisory Board. So what is what is the Scientific Advisory Board looking for? And I'm going to ask uh, David also about sort of what you think the, you'd be looking for, just to give you a heads up, Prabhakar. Computer science is a very young field. Uh, it's a little tenuous to speak of ideas that have stood the test of time. Uh, there's very few ideas that are 50 years old because the field is barely 50 years old. Right? Uh, but that said, uh, you, know, you can start to see some trends emerging. And if I look forward and try to say, what will we still be looking at 30, 40, 50 years from now uh, that was born today as an idea? That's the kind of idea that I'd like to see come out of the Simons Institute that has, in some sense, archival value in influencing uh, the intellectual development of the field in, in the decades to come. Uh, I want to be clear that uh, you said earlier I was the guy from industry. I'm not looking for you know, the, the quick buck in three years or five at all. But, but let, me, let me just tweak you on that a little bit if you... <laughs> <laughs> be my guest. I, I think David, uh, or maybe Dick said this, you, you know, I think theory has sort of home run potential, unlike, uh, you know, there are other fields of investigation with sort of more of a base hit uh, potential. And I, I think the theory has swung for the fences and, you know, and caused home runs like Google and and others. So, so what, what are the home what are home run potential? And now with your 
industry had. You said electronic commerce, of course, also. Uh, yeah, I didn't say electronic commerce, but uh, my point was the internet was an artifact that has a sound theoretical underpinning, right? So there's no question in my mind that if we drive towards the intellectual home runs, the economic fallout will take place along the way. Uh, I think you started saying it, so let me just uh, sound a little bit partisan as a theorist by training here. Uh, if, if we do look back over the last 50 years, I think relative to the investment that we put in theoretical computer science relative to other disciplines, it's had a disproportionate impact on the field and on industry. Right? And, and so that is exactly what I expect will happen if we as custodians of the Science, of the science Institute do a good job. That's what I look for from the Science Beyond that, I wouldn't try to tell these guys what to do because they know better than me. Uh, David, what uh, does the Simons Foundation, uh, David uh, Eisenbach, sorry, what are, what are the expectations of the foundation in terms of sort of success of the, of the institute? Of course, it's a, a complicated issue, and one sees, one knows success when one sees it in a certain <laughs> sense. But certainly, we expect the institute to become a first stature in the world of com theoretical computer science, the inner world of that. We expect the impact on the sciences to be large and, and visible. Well, on the other, and, and continuing in that direction outward, uh, we expect it to have impact on society and to welcome the kinds of questions that, that do come from industry and from outside. Uh, looking more inward, uh, the only, in my experience, the Institute model is a rather robust one. You get a bunch of people together, and unless you mistreat them, they're pretty happy because they're sharing their, their uh, world with each other. But it is possible to mistreat them, and so governance is, and um, the kind of organization of the Institute on the ground is very important, that it really serves its members and is seen to serve them. There'll be exit surveys and lots of ways of measuring that, uh, the, the rumors of good governance, good management, and bad come out very far. Uh, and so we certainly will be looking for that. Um, we hope that the Institute over the 10-year period that we're promising funding will be able to raise significant funds itself and move towards independence, uh, to independence, maybe at least towards independence. And there are lots of, of good signs for that. I think the involvement of Google already is, is one of them in Microsoft Research. Uh, I think those are the primary points that we have in mind. Super. I'd like to uh, throw it open to the audience, and I'd promised Bernd, there you are, Bernd, the Strumfels to, uh, to kick us off. So, Bernd. Yeah. Yeah, take a microphone, Bernd. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can identify yourself also. So I can say, Bernd Strumfels, <laughs> professor of mathematics. <laughs> I had a great pleasure to uh, serve as the NAF representative on the committee that uh, worked on the proposal, and I'm extremely happy with uh, the way everything worked out. Uh, I'd just like to uh, say that uh, now we have to deliver, we have to roll up our sleeves. So uh, I'm part of a proposal that uh, ties in the mathematical aspect, the computer science aspect, hopefully uh, for next year. And uh, I'm particularly excited about the connection between MSI and, and uh, the Simon Institute. I hope, uh, Uh, if you don't have, oh, please, uh, Cal. We can uh, offer you another mic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, Cal, try this one. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Calvin Moore, mathematics. Um, Something uh, in the, uh, the mission of MSRI is very important, namely training postdocs. You're training the next generation. I didn't hear anything about that in discussing the mission and goals of this. Anyone take comment on, on the training functions, especially postdocs? Uh, postdocs will be at the heart of the institute. Uh, in each, uh, in each of the two programs in a given semester, we 
expect to have uh, about four organizers, uh, about 10 senior scientists, and then uh, a group of about eight postdocs who will be chosen partly for their brilliance, but also for the relevance of their interest to the, to the uh, topic of the, of the semester. And the training of those postdocs will be extremely important. Uh, we also want to give these postdocs the option of contributing to our outreach to uh, K through 12 education and the training of teachers by um, arranging for uh, teams in which a postdoc will guide uh, teachers and students to uh, the development of curricular materials. Uh, so the, the postdocs are the lifeblood of the institute. We'll have uh, typically 16 postdocs in, in residence at any given time. And um, what I hope and which I, what I observed decades ago when I led a program at MSRI is that these postdocs will find the program very enriching and broadening so that they will come out of it with a much broader, uh, if I can overuse the word worldview, a much broader uh, world view, a much broader sense of the scope of the field than they had when they came in. Very good. Uh, Peter, I, uh, we, have, we have one more member from the Scientific Advisory Board, Peter Norving. Peter Norving is also from Google. I have to say, when we put the proposal together, Prabhakar was actually at Yahoo. So, uh, <laughs> so that's how we have uh, two people from Google. <laughs> But I'd love to have you talk about uh, machine learning and where, where you, uh, you Yeah, so, so I apologize for uh, Google uh, out outnumbering the rest of the valley. Uh, <laughs> we'll try not to do it again. But uh, it's great to uh, have the Institute here and, and thank you to, uh, to Jim and, and to the Institute uh, for hosting it. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, working with you, uh, excited about these topics that you've been talking about. And, uh, and trying to think about what the right way is for us to interact in terms of uh, exchanging people back and forth. Is there uh, computing facilities that, that we could help with or uh, uh, helping pu publicize it and uh, you know, whatever you think makes sense, uh, we want to uh, work together as a partner. Uh, John, may I descend on you? We have John Gage, formerly from uh, Sun and uh, now from Kleiner Perkins, right? Is that, uh, and also an alum. You could try some microphones, too. <laughs> I think this sounds uh, extraordinarily fertile. I was fascinated by the thought there's a possibility to take the most advanced computer science and make it accessible to kids globally in the K-12 environment. And, uh, focus on that, particularly utilizing the new extensions of internet into regions previously untouched, might provide a very compelling story for those undergraduates seeking to find a way to extend their theoretical knowledge into practical change in, in societies. I have no question for the panel except to say, uh, what do you think we could learn from the past experience at MSRI in the public outreach? Uh, I'm thinking in particular of some of the television programs and the exploratory panels that were held at MSRI that had a public content that was aimed to entice people into the study of mathematics and computer science. Uh, well, thank you for mentioning those those programs. This is, you know, the, one of the central missions of MSRI is uh, is public outreach to help the public understand the importance not only of mathematics but the but of ways of mathematical ways of approaching problems and understanding our world uh, obviously computer science has transformed our society all over the world in many ways the same way that uh, same way that uh, other earlier era, eras of technological advance have transformed our society but i think it's a it's a, a situation in which very few people really understand the nature of that change or understand the the uh, the mechanisms behind it. So there is a lot of curiosity, I think. I mean, for people to try to understand what are those boxes doing, and what are they capable of doing, uh, which is even more important. I mean, to to get a sense of what the possibilities are, if they can understand what the fundamental principles are. So I think if uh, if the Simons Institute can can uh, 
can do some of these outreach programs that, uh, that help people understand what the fundamental concepts are, that will be a great service to us. I mean, great service to society. And there's no reason that it has to be just local, of course. I mean, they, you know, they, like you say, we, we record them, we, we stream them, we put them on the web. Uh, and make them available to a wide, wide variety of people. I'm, I'm sure the, the Science Institute has, uh, has many of the same uh, 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 goals in mind. So. And, and just to add to that, it seems that this um, outreach component really fits in well with the, the mission of Berkeley in general. And we've seen uh, students who, um, from all areas of science, get really excited about the possibilities of bringing their excitement about science and computing and mathematics into uh, K-12 classrooms. I wonder if I could take that question and, and take it to a, a little bit of a different place too. Um, you know, uh, computing and mother nature have uh, one really important thing in common. Uh, they really don't care what you think the outcome ought to be. And uh, Jim touched at this a little bit, you know, about the difficulty, you know, who cares what you meant, I did what you said. And uh, there's an element that came through in preparing this about really computing and our perspective on the scientific method itself and the practice of science, which I think is going to transcend not just the lower grades, but I hope it's there, but all the way up. Uh, you know, who would have expected pharmaceuticals to be the waste product of the dye manufacturing 100 years ago? But it was a recent talk, a computational biologist out of Harvard, that in cleaning up the data, they were in fact discarding the most important effluents, the things that got at the fundamental volatility of the genes. Um, I think Umesh Vajrani put forward, you know, when an experiment has an exponential number of outcomes, how is it that you're going to use it to corroborate your theory? And perhaps ideas from interactive proofs and whatnot. So I hope it also transcends all the way up to, you know, those of us with gray hair and how we think about the very nature of science from but, but, a computational perspective. Let me, let me perspective. follow up on that. You know, we've been talking about the impact of the, the Institute on uh, graduate education and postdocs and so on. So, I mean, is what you're saying that this will really lead us to think about uh, mathematics, physics, chemistry, theory of computing as sort of the foundations for, a, for, for an education in a, in a university? Is that, is that the kind of impact you'd expect this institute to have on? Uh... Uh, I would. I think that you know, touches on a variety of different sides. I mean, you could imagine we've talked a good bit about data analytics. You know, imagine if you were to have the entry level graduate course in data analytics across all fields. Obviously, we could never have done that. Well, maybe in the future world of modular internet-based learning and you know, online tools, maybe so. But I think also, just in the way that you know, calculus gave us a framework, uh, that our ability to compute, to simulate, to verify beyond our wildest dreams uh, may cause us to even change how we, how we introduce science and how we think of it as we hold on to it. From the audience, if you don't mind, I see Roger Strauch in front of us. He's the trustee of uh, the uh, MSRI and also on all of our advisory boards. So, Roger, would you? Wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, actually, uh, one of the things that's been going through my mind is in, not directly related to your, to your mission, but just I'm wondering in the future, do you think your, these, these theories will need to be proven on computers? And are they going to be inorganic or organic or emeritage uh, is what I've been thinking. And I'm, if anyone wants to comment on what we think the platform, the computers will look like in the future, I'm, I'm curious. Well, I don't know the answer. Uh, <laughs> um, however, uh, s certainly nanotechnology is going to be involved and there may be uh, techniques of molecular self-assembly, which will lead to new computing platforms. Um, an, another possible outcome, you, you commented on uh, simulation and verification of uh, theories. Um, one of the things that could happen in the field of quantum computing, we have this mysterious theory of quantum mechanics, which even the experts find so strange. Um, it has been tested only on very small 
numbers of uh, interwoven interacting particles. And um, when, we have to, when we face the challenge of building a quantum computer, um, this will be extended um, to interactions among multiple quantum bits, and surprises may occur. So one possibility is that fundamental quantum mechanics could be revised in the light, could need to be revised in the light of quantum computing. What will be, uh, is there a policy or, or thinking about quantum computing as part of the uh, activity of the, uh, of the center, of the institute? Uh, we're planning a program probably in the uh, spring of 2014 um, on the problem of uh, computing ground states of quantum mechanical systems. And uh, we do have an institute for quantum computing here headed by um, Umesh Vazirani in computer science, jointly with uh, Brigitte Whaley in chemistry, and there are a number of the physicists and chemists uh, involved, and uh, there's even a novel undergraduate course taught by uh, Umesh jointly with a physicist where they introduce quantum mechanics from the viewpoint of quantum computing. So um, it's, it's very much in the air. Uh, quantum computing is a uh, high risk, high potential area. Uh, we don't know if we'll ever be able to build a working quantum computer, but if we do, um, it'll be revolutionary, and uh, the first thing that will happen is that we'll have to revise our entire view of uh, cryptography and security, because quantum computers can break the codes. If quantum computers could be realized physically, uh, they would break the codes such as the RSA code that are presently used for data security. So it's an incredibly important area, but one with extremely high risk because it may be that niggling little technical details will prevent us from building these quantum computers. We simply don't know. Thank you. This uh, physics course, of course, is a very celebrated course. It's Physics 137, which was Oppenheimer's course that has now been modified to, to teach uh, theory of computation, but... Uh, now, Dick, you'd be okay if we replace that with some other very, very hard mathematical problems and as the basis for future cryptography, some well, other that, things uh, we can't solve? That's another research area. Another one of the programs that um, has been proposed is what they call post-quantum cryptography. So now that we know that the um, commonly used uh, crypto systems based on uh, factoring of integers and the like, would be broken if quantum computers could be realized. Um, there's a growing research area as to uh, uh, whose goal is to devise new crypto systems which provably could be broken, uh, could not be broken even by quantum computers. So that's a program that we might run in the future. Brian. Hi, uh, I'm Brian Harvey, computer science. Um, it's fascinating hearing about the applications of CS theory to things like physics and biology and economics. Uh, but I'm an old fogey, and I'm wondering if um, anyone has any predictions about how the work done at the Institute will affect sort of traditional computer science um, practice like operating systems and programming languages. Uh, I'll try if nobody else wants to venture. Um, I think you've got, uh, Prabhakar can go after Prabhakar. you. <laughs> well, um, I, I would answer in a way that might disappoint you slightly. Um, I think that we, uh, the, the first 50 years of computer science has led, led to tremendous advances in compilers, operating systems, digital design, databases. Uh, areas which are sort of the, uh, the province of, of uh, the inner world of computing. Uh, I see the growth as coming largely in the exterior reach, so that uh, e even though undoubtedly there will have to be advances in operating systems, for example, parallelism is changing the game very much, um, and I'm all for it. Uh, my personal focus is more to think about how curricula would have to change to encompass 
uh, the growing interactions between computing and, uh, and the world of science, and including social science. Dick was uh, spot on. Uh, I, I've, I personally find it a little hard to grasp the notion of traditional computer science because computer science is a tradition that's evolving all the time. Uh, so, so to pick up on Dick's example, it baffles me that we don't have every undergraduate being trained in machine learning or in large-scale distributed computing because that's what they're going to do out there in the real world. So making those things optional seems strange. Now, the trouble with undergraduate education is as you try to cram in these new fields uh, at the expense of what, right? And that is a debate that people like David Culler will figure out, I guess. So, <laughs> so I'd actually like to contribute just a comment here because I, I teach classes that include engineering students and biology students and math and statistics and students from all over campus. I teach bioinformatics or computational biology. The students who come from the life sciences have a really hard time with anything computational. And this puts them at a disadvantage in understanding anything about the methods that they're using in their research. And there's something that I realized as a computer science student, as an undergraduate and then a PhD in computer science, it changed how I think about things. There's something about the computer science training which is so fantastic for thinking in a structured, very logical way. So you can approach hard problems and figure out solutions. We have to bring some of that into not only computer science training. I mean, I agree. I think you were talking, Prabhakar, about getting machine learning at the undergraduate level for computer science students. But there needs to be some type of real computer science training that happens across campus. I, I, I'm, I think this is critical. And because this is the new, fu the future of our students are going to have to go out there and be more, I don't know what the correct term is, but the equivalent of literate in computer science is mm -hmm. computer science literate. They have to have that for us to actually reach them. Please, uh, the person next to David. Find it. Go ahead. Yeah. OK. Hi, my name is Diana Lizarraga, and I'm a director here at Berkeley. I run five diversity in science research programs here for undergraduates. Um, two of them are women in science, and the umbrella of my program is called the Cal Nerds Program, and Nerds actually stands for New Experiences for Research and Diversity in Science, and the students came up with that. So go nerds. Um, I, I really am excited to hear about this opportunity and hear about um, how everybody came together as a team and brought this here. My question is, might you expand upon how this institute will um, connect with undergraduate students who are seeking the PhD STEM track? Do you want to take that, Dick? Uh, I, I really don't uh, have a quick, quick answer to that. I, I do think that... Uh, uh, we might try to emulate some other universities which have had a greater uh, penetration of computer science. So for example, uh, Princeton University, uh, I visited there recently, 71% of their undergraduates take a computer science course. So I think we have to view uh, computer science as a, a fundamental skill, uh, just as we think of arithmetic and spelling as fundamental skills. Computational thinking uh, will have to be injected into the curriculum. So, yeah, I, I certainly would, would agree with that. I think it's time that uh, computer science now grows up uh, and takes on more of, of that role. But I think coming back to the, the question of really what, what's the role the institute itself will play relative to the pipeline and those flows, I'd say the word is inspiration. I think uh, it's really important that the ideas that folks from around the world are coming here together to grapple with, to advance the state of knowledge, and that they have something to do with science, and they have something to do with math, and they have something to do with computing, and it all happens in a small number of people made a difference. I think to the extent that we can allow people to bask in some of that and to be inspired by it is uh, probably going to make as much difference as any particular mechanism, although I hope we get the mechanisms in place too. Uh, Mark, uh, you've been waiting. Could I? Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just going to add, uh, you know, MSRI has a program uh, along these lines, MSRI Up, for the undergraduate program, where, where we particularly encourage people from underrepresented minorities and, and women 
uh, to, it's a REU type experience for, for undergraduates. I, I think it's been extremely successful and, uh, and has played a real role in, in getting people uh, into uh, a, a higher education track that they might not have, uh, might not have looked at before. Uh, I don't see any reason why there couldn't be something like uh, the SITC up uh, along those same lines. It, it, it depends on resources, of course. Be, I mean, because these things take uh, these things take not just money, but but dedication of a group of people that are willing to not only teach the classes and run the REUs, but mentor the students as they go through a process that largely they're not familiar with when they uh, you know when they enter it. And uh, but uh, you've got some great people on the on the uh, on the board here that really care about this. So uh, so I think uh, I think uh, the SITC up if it exists will be in good hands. Mark, uh, I had another question I was going to pose, but I, just to that last question, I think that having a connection through computer science uh, into all of these different fields that are not necessarily kind of through the normal STEM gateway process has a lot of potential for engaging underrepresented minority students, students traditionally who haven't participated heavily in these fields, kind of breaks the code, to use a bad pun, uh, in, in the sense of, of just creating new avenues, new portals, and, and, a, and a sense of freshness that, that maybe younger people, students, kids who play with computers in high school can, can grab onto. And I think there's a lot of potential there. I had another thing I wanted to, to add. Uh, or to say uh, the math department's commencement speaker this year was Freeman Dyson, who is a known heretic, uh, wrote a book called Disturbing the Universe, among others. And, and he spent his commencement address suggesting that we have neglected the field of analog computing over digital computing. And if you think about Horace Simon's comment that the human brain is aso astonishingly efficient compared to the modern digital computers, it's, it's worth pointing out that the human brain is not a digital computer, and in fact, the human brain doesn't even know it's a computer. Uh, and I, we don't have any neuroscientists on the panel here, but I have a basic question to pose to anybody in the audience or on the panel who wants to tackle it, is to, to what extent um, are we really going to be opening up the ideas of computing and, and moving beyond the dominance of digital computing in our thinking? And address these fundamental uh, these fun fundamental questions of neuroscience and computing in particular. Uh, when we when we began this effort of uh, putting our proposal together, uh, Mark urged us strongly to talk to natural scientists across the campus, and uh, one of the most responsive groups was the collection of neuroscientists. So we have been in touch with four or five neuroscientists from the. Uh, Redwood Center, the Helen Wills Institute, and the Department on Campus, and uh, we have already agreed to um, uh, to co-sponsor a workshop that they had already been planning to run. Now, specifically, exactly how analog computing will be involved, I don't know, because it may be that at, at a suitable level of abstraction, we can still talk about discrete units of information passing between neurons. Is this a legitimate field in computer science these days, and, and, and it, do people's well, careers uh, advance studying non-digital means like this? Well, Turing Prize winner uh, Leslie Valiant wrote a book in, published in 1995 called Circuits of the Mind, where he tried to prove some, uh, explore how the brain could possibly, plausibly do certain things that it does and try to show that it, there are certain other things that it couldn't do. Um, so. Um, this has not been uh, followed up uh, as a major branch, but it's certainly under the canopy of theory of computing. I want to get to just one more question. We have here one of the principals who first invested in Facebook and social networks. He's not uh, in say Cree. So in say where what will the institute be doing for the future of uh. social networks and all the so I, I grew it's up. Not unrelated to the recent IPO, yeah. of course. Uh, so. No, nothing at all. So I, I grew up a traditionalist, like many of us here, um, studied computer science here at Berkeley and uh, built a lot of the systems that help define internet technologies today. Um, so I think, I think some of the comments around bringing the base of computer science to the broader set of uh, the next generation of, of educated uh, individuals, I think, I think that's 
something I would deeply believe in. I think even at high school levels, I think computer science should need to be a fundamental course. I, I puzzle at why chemistry and physics are still, you know, first class citizens in those in those uh, curriculums yet. Computer science doesn't creep down to that level because the kids do they have the capacity to learn and absorb um, almost as much as the undergrads do. And, and I think by the time they come to university setting, they, they should definitely be more prepared and, and things like machine learning and, and data sciences and um, dealing with applications of, of insights from the data as opposed to just processing the data and, and being, being absorbed by the functionality of it, I think are, are gonna create the next generation of breakthroughs in the industry. And that's why I'm really excited about this institute. And, and it's uh, you know, the, the, the vast amount of work we do in, in Silicon Valley today is to look for new breakthrough ideas and not you know, how to take you know, your processing, transaction processing to down to the next millisecond, but really how much meaning can you derive from data and how much meaning can you derive from amounts of information that flow through the system and, and what, what, are, you know, what insights can you bear and what predictive insights can you bear. And those are things that are now driving our, our business as investors or as, as entrepreneurs and, and throughout the industry. And I think there's a lot of advances that institutes like uh, Simon's Institute can bring to help further that for the next generation where you know if we can create a quantum computer or have a you know byproduct or a language or a new system or a new operating system paradigm I think um, we'll just create you know unlock so much more potential for the industry as a whole in I'm glad to say the Institute uh, El Kanan Moselle right is uh, going to be proposing a uh, set of programs on random graphs and social and networks and so on isn't he is that uh, um, Which yeah, maybe there, more there, of passing interest to Yeah, there's a mathematical topic that's in the works for uh, fall of 2013 that deals with things like uh, social choice and uh, economic mechanisms. Well, thank you all very much, and I'd like to thank the panel to, uh, for their participation. I think it's best that you just stay because I, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, Graham Fleming, uh, who's our Vice Chancellor for Research, uh, but you know also the Melville Calvin Professor of Chemistry. So among other things, he's also agreed to give up his office in, the, uh, in Calvin Hall in addition to the building. Thank you very much, uh, Graham. Yeah, thank you, Shankar, and, and thanks to the panel and the audience for that fascinating and inspiring discussion. It's clear that the Institute is going to have a transformational effect on computing, on computing, on Berkeley, and on scholarship everywhere, from quantum mechanics to the design of computers, from undergraduate curricula to social science, from new industries that we can't even imagine. Um, it's difficult to see where the boundaries of the new institute might be. Um, clearly, it will enrich our intellectual life through the number of visitors and through the broader appreciation and application of the idea that physical and virtual <coughs> systems are computing devices. Um, that gives this picture that gives us a complementary intellectual framework with which to understand, predict, and perhaps learn to control the world. It's now time for me to take a few minutes to thank the many people who contributed to what was a true Berkeley effort. And this is a scary bit because you always worry about leaving someone out, so I'm going to put my glasses on for this. <laughs> of course, first and foremost, Dick Karp, Alistair Sinclair, and Christos Papadimitriou led the way. And David Culler and Ted Slayman from Computer Science and Mathematics, respectively, were really generous with their help and, and advice. But this was a true cross-campus collaboration, and Deans Shankar Sastry and Mark Richards were crucial. On the staff side, I'd especially like to thank Anne Jeffrey from my office, and Kristen Kane and Melissa Nideva from the College of Engineering. Paul Wright, the director of Citrus, very generously offered to provide initial space so that the Institute, institute could start right away in this building. Um, and then, David Eisenbud mentioned something about landscaping. So I'd like to tell you about a conversation I had um, on the final weekend when the decision was very close. And, and I had a conversation with Dick and, and with David about um, 
some extra things that we needed to take care of. One was a bit complicated, and, and uh, one was landscaping. So uh, <laughs> I called my boss, who was driving his car in Vancouver at the time, I think, pulled over at the side of the road, and I, I talked about the complicated one. And then I said, oh, no, by the way, uh, Simon's Foundation would like landscaping around Calvin Lab. And Bob said, well, you probably don't know, but I have a hobby of landscaping, and I'm going to need a retirement project. So, um, Inside the building, um, we owe a lot to Scott Shackleton and Harry Stock for their efforts in, in uh, planning how to convert the building into a, a world-class home for the Institute. And finally, but of course, most importantly, Jim Simons, Great thanks for his many years of friendship and partnership with the UC Berkeley campus. All of us are delighted that the Simons Foundation is making such a significant contribution to bringing about a new era in the theory of computing and its impact on scholarship, and very likely, the whole economy. Thank you, and congratulations.